This morning, we continue our series on everyday justice. Stopping in the midst of this busy summer, we are taking some time to begin to understand that the choices we make each day have a global impact. From the coffee we drink, to the clothes that we wear, to the car that we drive, to the chocolate we eat, all these choices are filled with aspects of relationship that are not apparent. As we think about our choices during these weeks, it's important for us to remember that in this place, we do not see issues of justice as something that stands apart from the narratives of our faith. Rather, we see justice as a core part of the foundations that we base our lives on. We heard Carlos lead us in a Lord's Prayer from Nicaragua today, his home country. Liberation theology, which came to us from that area of the world, reminds us that God is always on the side of the oppressed. The stories of the Hebrew Bible as well as the gospel show us again and again, it is not the powerful that God elevates. It is instead the poor, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the despised, the stranger. There is no doubt today we are surrounded by so much injustice as individuals and as a church that cares about what's happening in the world, it's difficult to know which of these issues to address first. We have readily admitted these past few weeks that the sheer magnitude of the problems every day can become paralyzing. Yet we've grown weary of feeling like we're not making a difference. In the first week of this series, we began to understand that when we feel overwhelmed, we see justice as an all or nothing endeavor. So we tend to throw up our hands and ask, how could I possibly change all of this? And we end up doing nothing. Yet together, we have started to believe that individual small changes, changes on a micro level, have the possibility of helping us tackle the larger macro issues that continue to need our attention. Today, we are continuing to work on how to respond to our world as individuals and as a community of faith. This week, we are tackling the issues of fashion and clothing and asking ourselves what it might look like to become an ethical shopper. Having four daughters meant I came to consider myself a shopping champion. When Fred and I married, I went by from buying only my clothes to buying clothes for three daughters and eventually a fourth daughter. And yes, sometimes all that shopping with them felt like cruel and unusual punishment. I hate to think how many hours we spent over the years in mega malls. I certainly learned more than anyone should ever have to know about clothes because each one of our daughters had their own unique style of shopping. Tara, our oldest daughter, would go through a store, pick up everything in sight, she would buy it all, take home a ton of things, and then come back and return 90% of it. Heather, our second middle daughter, liked to have help. So I spent many long hours sitting on those crummy little benches in dressing rooms, dispensing advice, which in the end she didn't heed anyway. Jessica, our youngest daughter, took a long time finding her own style, and it was quite interesting along the way. But when she did find it, she became very confident about what she liked, and she still is a good shopper. Holly, our other middle daughter, we had two middle daughters, was the hardest one for me to shop with. When Holly shopped, you had to go to every store in the mall. She
she looked at every single item of clothing in her size. And once you had made the complete tour, you had to go back and start over again in the first store. This time, she would choose what she wanted to buy, but she had needed to see all of the options before she made her choice. It was exhausting to shop with Holly. And once in a while, I would say to Fred, you have to take her shopping this time because I'm so afraid I'm going to strangle her in one of those stores. <laughs> when Holly's daughter Morgan was 9 or 10 and they were visiting us, Morgan asked if I would take her shopping. I said, of course, should we ask your mother to go with us? Morgan shook her head, rolled her eyes, and said, oh, no. Gaga, you have no idea what it's like to shop with my mother. I said, well, yeah, kind of I do. <laughs> In all those years of shopping for our daughters, with our daughters, and for myself, I never once thought about where our clothes were made or the condition, the conditions that the workers labored in. Julie Clausen, my friend, who wrote the book Everyday Justice, says, as a culture, we spend a lot of time thinking about what to wear. But in all of our thinking about clothes, we often fail to think about the story behind our clothes. My first wake-up call to this came in a scandal in the 90s about a celebrity clothing line. It was very public, splashed all over media. It turned out that the celebrities' clothes were being made by 12 and 13-year-olds at a global fashion plant owned by the celebrity in Honduras. That story opened my eyes to understanding that many offshore assembly plants were humiliating places to work, not only because of their deplorable conditions, but because they also couldn't ensure any of the workers' safeties. I also learned that at those plants, armed guards were used to intimidate and threaten the workers. Their tactics were part of an effort to keep these people from organizing for better working conditions. And I learned that for all that grief, at that time, the people employed there were making a whopping 31 cents an hour. For those people, the long days, the hard labor, and the poor working conditions left those girls and women unable to even dream of the possibility of a better life. They couldn't think about attending night school or Saturday school, as it is in much of Latin America, and bettering their lot in life. One would hope in the 20 years since that time, since that scandal, that things would have drastically improved. Sadly, that is not true. The statistics around fashion continue to be mind-blowing. Fashion is one of the most labor-dependent industries. One in six of the world's workers are employed in the fashion industry. Each year, we collectively purchase 80 billion pieces of new clothing globally. A recent study showed that between 2000 and 2014, fashion consumption increased by 60% around 80% of fashion workers are female. Today, to meet the demands of what is now known as fast fashion, those ever-changing window displays of fashion as we know it, have become even more reliant upon that low-cost labor. While many clothes are still made in Latin America, the fashion industry has now moved much of their labor to low-income Asian countries. Bangladesh, India, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. Those are now their countries of choice. And once again, in these countries, they recruit female factory workers because of their social and economic vulnerability. An Oxfam 2019 report found that 0% of Bangladeshi garment workers and 1% of Vietnamese garment workers earned a living wage. Children continue to be employed in these factories. They are often brought to work by their mothers, 
when they are as young as 10 years old. Easy to judge, why would a mother do that? But the reality is they need their daughters to work and help feed their families because one wage from that factory is not adequate. Sadly, today's fast fashion is not a pretty picture. Emma Watson, the wonderful actor who we know as Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter movies, supports a movement called Good On You. Their tagline is good on people, the planet, and animals good on you. These days, through groups like this, clothing lines are being given ethical brand ratings. Good On You even has an app for that. The tagline for the app is wear the change you want to see. You can download the app to discover ethical brands and you can see how your favorite brands measure up. I thought it would be a good idea yesterday to download that app. And I felt certain that two of the brands that I wear would have wonderful ratings. They did not. One of them is so bad that it isn't even rated. The other one received a rating of, it's a start. I read that while this brand has some good labor policies, it's not taking adequate steps to eliminate hazardous chemicals in its supply chain. I was so focused on fair labor practices that I hadn't totally thought through how clothing manufacturing affects our environment. Even though I'm told that this brand uses a medium proportion of eco-friendly materials, it has made no public commitment to eliminating hazardous chemicals. And there is no evidence that it has set a greenhouse gas emission reduction target. But on the bright side, it has made a commitment to set a science-based target. I don't know what that means and it's implementing water reduction initiatives. Who knew getting dressed in the morning was so hard? That whole thing should have made me feel better. I was hoping that I could still buy those clothes without any of the paralyzing guilt hanging around my neck in the scarves that I love to wear so much with that brand. It's discouraging to learn that while ethical may be the new black, not all black clothing is ethically made. You all may be far ahead of me in understanding how to shop ethically. I feel sure that if you are a millennial or from Generation Z, you can teach the rest of us a great deal about this issue. I spent a lot of time last night after I tried to work with that app to find a different answer. I spent time thinking about what small change I could make in my daily life regarding clothing. A small change that would have a global impact. And as hard as it is to admit, I have to admit I'm stumped. I was overwhelmed by what trying to act justly means for the choices I have to make with clothing and with shoes and with handbags and with ties and with sport coats and everything that our family buys. So you know that the first week we had gifts for you. We had metal straws to ask you to use that as a reminder of the environmental issues that we are dealing with. And last week, we asked you to give something. Because we talked about eating ethically, we asked you to go and make a donation for a single meal for Every Table, a charity that we love in Los Angeles. This week, though, I need to ask you to help me. So rather than having a gift or even a gem of an idea, I need your help. I hope those of you who are ethical shoppers already and those of you who are good researchers will help me, will help all of us to find a way to make a global impact with our shopping choices. 
I haven't decided what I'm going to do till I figure that out, till you help me figure that out. I feel like I need to make a radical change. And yet, it's probably as hard for you to think about that as it is for me. I need your help. I look forward to those emails, lfragan, fccla.org, those text messages, whatever it is. Send them and help us figure out how we can begin to be ethical shoppers. May it be so. May it be so for us.